Yeah, uh, welcome to the second lecture in our course ACE 812912. I'd like to welcome in particular our lecturer, Professor Mosto Onwo. I'd like to welcome all the vice chancellors who are attending this session and our participants. Uh, uh, oh, I can see. Professor Arik Babu is here, Professor uh, Michael Faborode, of course, Professor Nimi Briggs, our grandpa, has already been here, seated. Uh, let's uh, recognize a few more people before I yield to Professor Mostu Ono. Uh, I can see our participants from all over the place. There's somebody called Modinat. Modinat, if you if you there, please. We don't like Modinat. Uh, don't wait to me. We like the full name. You can see the others. Uh, Professor Doctor Akito Kim. We don't want it like that. You have to write your full name, like Peter Okebukola, and and so on. Yeah, please. Uh, let's try to adopt that format uh, for our next class. You can see Vatai Lassisi. You can see Professor Juma Shabani. Oh wow. Oh, Juma, uh, we really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm going to introduce our professor uh, now. I'll share my screen and then uh, so that you can see him as I read his uh, brief citation. Actually, his citation is about 500 pages. But uh, I just decided to uh, take all of the of the lines. Uh, please give me a minute. Let me check something. Yeah. Our professor today is Professor Mosu Onoha, uh, who studied at the Royal Esvo University in Budapest, Hungary, uh, where he majored in geophysics. He got his PhD sum cum laude in 1978. Uh, he served for two years as a postdoctoral research fellow at the Institute of Geophysics, Technical University of Klaus the left of in Germany, before he returned to Nigeria in 1980 to work at the University of Nigeria, Unsuka. Uh, uh, the lions and lions will claim that that's the only university in Nigeria, because the University of Nigeria. Well, he rose through the ranks to the position of full professor in 1988, full professor of geology. And uh, he served in the Nigerian University system as a teacher, researcher, and university administrator. Um, yeah, he was the holder of, uh, or occupant, of three different professorial chairs in geology endowed respectively uh, uh, the three professorial chairs uh, were, uh, uh, endowed in geology uh, by exxon mobile shell petroleum company of nigeria and um, petroleum technology development fund ptdf so he has been working in the oil industry so he must be a superlatively rich professor <laughs> Uh, between 1996 and 2002, he served as, tech, as a technology development advisor, subsurface development services at the Shell Petroleum Development Company of Nigeria Limited in Port Harcourt. He has over the years maintained a very active research profile. He has successfully supervised several postgraduate students and served on the boards of uh, a number of organizations. He currently enjoys the status of Professor Emeritus of the University of Nigeria, Asuka and is the current president of the Nigeria Academy of Science. His current research activities are in the areas of exploration, geophysics, characterization of petroleum reservoirs, and the te tecto physics, techno technophysics, and the mitigation of natural and man-made hazards in West and Central Africa. Maybe I can tell you a little bit about uh, uh, him being uh, an emeritus professor. Because some people, they will run into you as a, they, they will think that emeritus professor means uh, that you, uh, you know, where well, they don't know what it means. What emeritus professor means is that after you are offered service in a university, for instance, as a full professor, when you retire as a full professor, you can now apply 
and if the university finds that you are you stand you are really 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 good they then appoint you emeritus professor so you don't get somebody who is uh, uh, who is still serving in the university system being an uh, be serving before retirement as emeritus professor so what this means is that if you see any name say emeritus professor it means that that person has retired from the service of the university and is so needed in the university and all over the world that the university wants to retain him or her and then they are uh, uh, appointing uh, or her a meritorious professor. That, that, that needs to be clear to all our students because this is somebody who is a meritorious professor whereas the person is still uh, serving. So that said, I would like to now oh. yield to uh, Professor Most Honor uh, to give his uh, lecture. You have the floor, sir. You can share. The thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. I would like to uh, thank our facilitator general, Professor Ebukola. I want to thank you particularly for getting me involved in this. You know, I like teaching, I like sharing knowledge, and this is just another platform. So I'm very excited to be part of this. Thing. And I think Lasso, Lasso is doing something extraordinary. I just hope Lasso is doing something that is very, very, very different. And um, so I'd like to now share my screen and go ahead. I'm going to talk about three main things in the short time that I have. Three, three parts of uh, what I'm going to say this morning will be divided into three parts. I'm going to make some introductory remarks, which, because we are talking about uh, uh, developments in the world of science. So, uh, Professor Kapukola has given us a very important background, especially about Africa. But I'm going to talk about science in general and take a little time, maybe 10, 12 minutes of my total time we devoted to part one, so that I'll tell you the thing I have, the, what, what, what's my own part in it, and uh, talk about science in general. Then a larger part, maybe 15 minutes, uh, also the, what you can say carries a topic. What will you call the re recent developments? And in discussing that, again, I will break that into two parts. Uh, I'd like to talk about invention, I'd like to talk about innovation because people often confuse them. And then, of course, try as much as possible to rush through what I, I can call the most significant developments in the area of science. Then, of course, how all this is going to impact on those of us who teach, especially uh, the implications for uh, teacher education, which is the last part. And then, of course, that will be the end, and we can discuss. As you already know, I'm based at the University of Nigeria in Soka, as we have been it's about 40 years now, uh, since I came back to Nigeria uh, from Europe. And uh, I've largely been here. Of course, I've spent times out in other universities, in the industry, on leave of absence, as God charted my path. But I'm still here, and I'm speaking to you right here from the den of the lions and lionesses. Mm. So welcome to the University of Nigeria. <laughs> and let's leave this one now. My, my, my younger brother is there. He's VC of the premier, the first university in Nigeria. Oh, yes. But sometimes we, are, we struggle for who is the first indigenous. <laughs> and which one? The university, the only university in Nigeria. Now, my, my work has been in the area of geosciences. And when we talk about geosciences, so you see the science is there. Just a like Jew comes a little part. They actually today, today, the way we use the word, com uh, composed of uh, several variety of disciplines. Geology, for example, I serve in the Department of Geology. But there are some other departments, some have geology, some have geophysics, and so on. But as you read, I'm a geophysics major. So you have geology, you have geophysics, you have petrophysics, you even have reservoir engineering. All these are branches of geosciences today as practiced in the industry. And when we talk about geology itself, we can break that into many disciplines, which 
you can break into many other subjects. The operational geology, stratigraphy, sedimentology, petrography, geochemistry, and so on. Many, many areas of geology, especially in the oil industry. And every of these areas are very important. When we talk about geophysics, which is our own specialized area, myself and Prof. Sibu Olayinka, geophysics is actually the physics study of the physics of the Earth, especially its electrical, its gravitational, magnetic fields, how waves propagate through it, and what we can use this for. My job, when people ask me sometimes, what do you do? I say, well, I teach how to find what is hidden in the ground. Uh, something is hidden in the ground, and then I don't have to dig up the whole place. I can walk around the whole place. I work with archaeologists who are looking for things that are hidden just not too far below. And I work with those who are looking for things that are hidden five kilometers inside the ground, and we can and, and do all that. So... Um, what my work has spanned various areas of the oil industry, especially gathering the data. There are many areas, contribution of seismic uh, technology is actually what dominates oil and gas exploration. Can be done on land, can be done on what if you look at the, the picture uh, here, for, ex for example, uh, mangrove swamps, this is a typical Niger Delta environment. And then of course, offshore ships have been in all of them. So as geophysicists, we are job in all exploration. We go out, we supervise our position. Sometimes we have, have to move uh, thousands, hundreds of men through the field to gather the data, interpret the data. And uh, another good picture of uh, uh, what goes on in the swamps, in the mangroves, typical Niger Delta environment, and, uh, and people who are looking for oil and gas. Drilling rig. They can drop you on a chopper right there. It can be interesting for those who work uh, with the system. Now, a couple of years ago, exactly 20, 21 years ago, then I was in Shell, then I was technology development advisor. My main job then was, then there were a lot of new technologies coming up in, in, in the oil and gas industry. And um, the diagram taken from a publication of the Academy of Science and Shell, uh, from a lecture at Kofa uh, Biomiro, uh, this of International Affairs, about 20 years ago, 15th of January, 2000. You saw everything, new millennium, new millennium, what was going to come up? I had what I called the Petroleum Exploration and Production, EMP, value equation, an equation, a value equation. You see, what about equation is that? Well, now I'm speaking from my house in University of Nigeria and Soka. And Professor K. Bukola is in Lagos. Some of you are in other cities. And Horn is in Burundi. Others are everywhere. So at that time, networking, network computing were just coming up. And I was sure network computing was going to ensure, we're looking ahead 20 years. I said, very soon, we're going to have people working in different areas. And then all the companies had to do was to freedom to choose and select the best two. And then you have geographically at the bottom of the pyramid, geographically dispersed professionals, plus they're able to collaborate on critical projects like when we are all talking, question and answer, anybody can, using the best breed of tools, which the web is allowing us to do now, can analyze all the data, and then all this will bring as equal to all this, this plus this plus this plus this, equals increased profits, which means faster, more accurate decisions, reduces risk. I'm going to come back to, in a sense, some of this. So, the last century, the 20th century, was really great for science. Think of developments in quantum theory. Think of developments in the double helix. You know, the, the origin of uh, uh, the DNA molecule and so on. And then think of the internet also. Now, 20 years have already gone in the new, in the new century. And I tell you, no one can predict what will be the counterparts of some of these things I've just mentioned, that you can call edge shaking inventions or innovation, the DNA thing, the quantum theory, and the internet. We don't know. But what we do know is that a lot of things, are, uh, technology will continue to transform what we're doing. And, um, well, science requires massive investment. It requires plenty of investment 
in infrastructure, in policy, in people. And um, we're going to talk about people, the people who impact the knowledge. Accumulation of knowledge itself is good. It's, it's of public good, but it also has to yield wider economic and social benefits. We need those benefits. So I like uh, briefly the pivotal role that science, engineering, and technology can play. We have applied science. We have natural science. Sometimes we talk about natural science. There are very many ways of dividing basic science, pure science, or can talk about physical and biological sciences, or even formal sciences like mathematics, statistics, logic. And then applied sciences will include uh, engineering, medicine, and so on. No matter how we decide to classify science, the point is that science is allowing us to do things that were unthinkable many decades ago. Even in the last 25 years, some of the things we, we are doing now, people couldn't have believed them. Of course, science can be used for good, like all the new things from your mobile phone, you can do so many things. But we have also seen negative outcomes of science, like the atomic bomb, the nuclear bomb. So, um, now, I would like, as we now look at what's going on in science, I would like to begin by just trying to differentiate between innovation and invention. I like to insist that they are not exactly the same, even if many times we try to uh, uh, take them synonymous, make, uh, behave as if they are the same. Innovation and invention are different. Whereas innovation may be defined as let's say change that has value. Invention may perhaps be defined as something that's actually just new, novel, and we, if possible without precedent. But the truth is that notwithstanding all that, most inventions are actually they come out of making improvements in things that were already existing. That, that is the truth. In fact, I can then say that there are actually very few totally new inventions. We do have, but there are very few. But the thing about invention is novelty. Novelty is an essential part. That is, there's something that is just, it's just out of nowhere, so to say, is new. So whereas novelty may not necessarily be an essential part of innovation. They may have been there, but you've done something now different. So when you create a product or create a new process for the very first time, then that's an invention. We are, we are seeing people who are doing that. For example, uh, Thomas Alva Edison, they used to call him the Wizard of Menlo Park. We know him better as a man who gave the world light, Thomas Edison. He was an inventor. He was an inventor, and of course, he invented so many things. So, the innovation happens when somebody improves on or makes a significant contribution to something that has already been invented. For example, Steve Jobs. He's, he was an innovator. We can use past tense now. He was an, an innovator. So, for example, take a look at, uh, I don't know what type of phone you have. But if you look at Apple's uh, iPhone, the Apple's iPhone, Apple, what did they do? They took a stagnant product, a stagnant product category, the mobile phone. Mobile phone was already in existence. And then completely rethought how it can be used. And that's what's going on today. So they took an existing product or product category. They took existing technologies, but then they did something. They, they, they use, they did something that has reshaped completely what we do in society. So that's, 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 that's a kind of thing that uh, Apple did. So I can give you, I can go on to give you a few examples very quickly 
a few examples of innovations that have shaped our lives in the past. For example, the printing press. It was a major, major innovation. Where would we have been without that? Without paper, paper, Johannes Gutenberg, long time ago. But it was a, it was a, it was it was the major historic. Then the steam engine and the steam-powered vehicle. Then the mechanical vehicle, which made it possible now for us uh, to begin to travel. And then, of course, the telephone itself was also a major uh, historical development. The radio, the television, I can name one, video games, personal computers, and of course, the WWW, the internet that we are using and that is making it possible for us to talk to each other. All these have been email and Google search. I tell students, life has never been so easy. In those days, all you 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 could just uh, look for uh, the the big. Uh, now we, we, you can Wikipedia virtually anything. You can Google virtually anything. If you just type something, Google is there at your at your at your disposal. So there are lots of them, and I can name a lot more of what I can call technological innovations. Wi-Fi, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, for those of you who tweet. Now, the thing is this, all these the, the innovations, they resulted from serious research and development efforts on the part of the people who brought them. So I will spend another few minutes in talking about research and because that's what actually has made all the things we're talking about possible especially today for very many years the united states dominated uh, global research and development efforts i'm showing you data from just a little about the last 60 years so to say up to 1960 United States control almost 70 percent, 69 percent of global. They had the share. They were clear pace setters. They led the rest of the world, which includes any other country you care to talk about, including Soviet Union. Then, 31 percent. But by a few years ago, at least I have complete data for 2017 and 2018. The United States has slumped. The, their global share, the, the U.S. share of global R&D spending was just 28 percent. The rest of the world, 72 percent. And you are going to see a shift that has followed this in some of the things that are coming. I don't know how many of you are holding Samsung phones or any of those things that are coming from the East. I have one myself. <laughs> now, um, global R&D for selected countries and i chose those ones that you know now between 2000 and the last 20 years just look at the u.s share that's how it's coming down and look at even the other oecd countries japan coming down even germany now you cannot fail to see the red line that's rising almost exponentially that is china that's going to explain a lot of things that are going on now. Let me zoom this a little bit better so that you can see. For example, this is growth in R&D expenditure since 2000. You can see the Chinese growth, more or less exponential. And let me leave these ones that are here. Look at UK and the United States, Italy, all of them are here. The next ones, look at South Korea, Taiwan, and of course, today's Russia. So this is R&D expenditure. And this translates almost into what people get out of it. Way back some 21 years ago, one of the Chinese leaders, they knew in China. His Zhejiang Zemin said, in today's world, the core of each country's competitive strength is one, intellectual innovation. Two, technological innovation. 
and, and of high-tech high -tech industrialization. industrialization. And, and that, that is what actually explains China's drive for innovation. Very strong sense of national purpose, strong investments in education and training. The last part of our talk was all these things. When I would have talked about big data, when I would have talked about artificial intelligence and so on in the next few minutes, then we will now say education and training. So the new strategy to move rapidly up the value chain so, plenty of money, 279 billion in 2017. That's what China. And if not for COVID-19 COVID setbacks, China was aiming to bring about 2 million electric vehicles this year in 2020, according to the Minister of Science and Tech some two years back. So, they've done all that. So, there is an innovation imperative. I want to leave this now. It is a key to maintaining a, con a country's competitive position in the global economy for African countries. There's no other alternative. And universities and small businesses are the ones that play a key role in this. And then, of course, we also need new institutions. We need to do some things to make sure we arrive. Um, you can read up some of the things about leading countries uh, around this spending dollar basis and so on so um now a very quick overview of some of the most recent developments 5g serverless computing blockchain robotics biometrics when i talk about biometrics i'm not talking about when you go to the embassy they capture your fingerprints and so on the technology today of biometrics is the one that recognition, pattern recognition, they will recognize you completely. Let's say if you go to an ATM, because of uh, something can sense your retina of your eye, and then they know you are the one. So nobody can impersonate you. So uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, drones, there are very many. I'll just say a few words about some of them since I have put them on the board, uh, some of these uh, latest technologies. Let me say 5G. Please, we are scientists. 5G has come. It's not in many places, but the research on it had been there. Even China is already working on 6G. I don't want to get into the politics of Corona and so on, but I like to assure you that 5G, you cannot run away from it because it's, it gives you the ability to manipulate, to move and analyze across wireless platforms. You can do so many things at an incredible speed, faster than the things we are doing now. And it's not going to be stopped. What the industrialized nations are fighting is who is going to dominate 5G. Let's leave that. Serverless computing, that is allowing organizations to create an IT environment uh, that is completely automated and abstracted, so the infrastructure is different. In other words, you don't need servers. Blockchain, which is... Uh, uh, a technology again that enables some of you have heard about money now and cryptocurrency all this it is the ability to store ability to securely keep data that these things allow them to do robotics so all these are possible these are all new technologies and they are possible because we are in the era of big data and artificial intelligence. The AI, artificial intelligence, is actually behind many of these other things I had listed earlier. I listed very many of the latest trends. Now, if you follow the news in any way, you, of course, undoubtedly heard about big data. There are training topics. Big data is just a phrase used to mean a massive volume of both structured and unstructured data that are so large it's difficult to process using our normal traditional methods.
that's, 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 that's just what that means. Um, and uh, in, in most enterprises where, where big data is involved, it's, it's called big data because the volume of data is too big. The velocity with which the data is moved is too high, while the data variety could be very varied and very complex. Uh, the Nigeria Academy of Science uh, in November 2019, we held a workshop in the uh, Sheraton Hotel. We just call it the future of work. We're looking at the future of work, and that's one of the questions. Maybe one of the uh, Pro, pro, projects or ten papers some few students can look at. What what will happen? What's going to happen to our work workers in Nigeria? What do we need to do? Of course, we had our own blend. It was mainly to make sure that the academia and government were listening and preparing. So we need to train the people. And in that meeting, we had at least seven vice chancellors there and so on were there, and also people from government and then oil industry. So. Big data is, is a game changer. So, uh, and to be able to do this, we need to get our own people ready. We need to get our own people ready. All over new ways of working. So all this we've been talking about, what are the implications for those who teach science, those who teach engineering courses, those who teach the so-called technological courses, whether they're in medicine and, and those who teach mathematics. Well, talking about teaching, I'm talking to people who, who know more about education principles than myself, but I think the main purpose of education, if I borrow from learning system, is to educate individuals within society, to prepare and qualify them uh, so that uh, they can work to integrate people into society, teach them morals and values and so on. That's what education is for. And uh, for us, for those of you who teach young people to prepare youngsters for adulthood so that they can take over the next generation of leaders. When I look at people like ourselves, sometime much later this year, I'll be 73 years old, and there are people older than me, there are others who are over 60. We need to get people who are going to come after us. Education is very important, enhances the well-being and so on, expands opportunities. And that's why in, in societies where things work well, access to education is a common value. And public education is seen as a fundamental responsibility of states, as how it is in many places. Now, I, I must talk a little bit about higher education because not just general education. Because all these technologies and the things we are talking about, although the foundation, mathematics, physics, chemistry, are very important, but higher education is so important. It's the main agent for sustainable socioeconomic and cultural advancement. This is known. Because that's when you produce people with a high quality of knowledge and skills and competencies that you require uh, to run the various sectors of the economy. And, but the thing is this, the quantity and the quality of investment in education will usually determine the extent the education system achieves or fails to achieve its objectives. That's where the problem is in Nigeria. Uh, Professor K. Bukola has written lots and lots about this, the quantity and quality. So we, uh, uh, I will soon get to what do we do. Well, what do we want in Nigeria? I want to move from being a consumer nation to a producer nation, not just when I say Nigeria, I believe in other African countries. I want to move from assembling to inventing things, from being copycats to innovations. I want to invent things, I want to design them, I want to brand them, I want to market them. These are the things we like for our country. I want to put together long lasting, world tested products. That's what we like. I want to Develop a culture of generating, if I can say, revolutionary scientific ideas. Want to acquire managerial experience. But what do we require for this? Not enough for students uh, to infuse them only with theoretical body of knowledge. We need to make sure they acquire strong skills and a, a culture of experimentation. In the oil, oil and gas industry, where some of us have been training people for them and so on, 
uh, we, we, at a time, there was a big gap, very big gap between those that were coming out of our universities and those that were employing. And a company like Shell had to establish a school. No worry. So that they come out, you come out as a graduate, you go through that place, so they employ you. And that gap is what they were trying to, to make up. So we have to find a way to foster creative thinking. So those of us that are teachers, we have to find ways of getting our, our students to begin to, to stop learning by root and use their heads, their brains, their hands. So STEM education will enable us to produce individuals with the high quality knowledge and skills and competencies that we require that will drive our economy. You see, being a human capital production process, so education, as the experts know, has its traditional variables too of a production chain. As you have input variables, you have process variables, and you have output variables. And all the stakeholders in education at any level, they want the best quality of output. So how do we ensure that? Funding or financing. And the manner in which the available funds and other resources are used. These are the key components. So for our science teachers, first they have to have the funding. That's correct funding. We have to invest. And then the manner in which we get them adequately trained, retool them, and then we'll be moving. There's a slide I borrowed from uh, former Minister of Education, Dr. Bia Kwesili, some of you know it, what she called then, or the ministry then, at that time, called the funnel syndrome. So we have our secondary schools turning out a large number of people leaving the schools every year. There's a bottleneck, the end of the funnel is a jam bottleneck, because jam can only take about, uh, I mean, the universities all together can only take a small percentage of those who take jam. They meet close to a million and a half to two million. I don't know what the letters will be. Who we'll ride the jam every year? 1.7 million. And then, but only a small number. And then, when they graduate, they enter a big warehouse looking for a job. The jobs are right. And so that's the problem. And a lot of them remain in the warehouse for almost each dot or each person that is on the right here, where you have uh, the jobs. There are about 10 or 15 that are still in the warehouse. And part of the problem Okay, I will quickly round up so that I can have time for q and A. I'm sure some of the other things would come up when we discuss. So, um, Work is going on in our universities, significant research work is going on, uh, producing all manner of R&D, but most of these have not been translated into innovation that can drive industrial competitiveness. That's, that's what I found as a problem with our people. So our research system has not impact, impacted significantly on industrial and hence national development. That's the job we teachers have to try to change. So, so, to be relevant, we need to teach the next generation. Our labs have to be up to date. Our teachers have to be retooled. And uh, I don't want to tell you that there are many critical issues with education in Nigeria. You can read that. Most of them are taken from other uh, existing documents and so on. The problems, uh, current capacity, uh, inadequate facilities on the utilized staff and so on, minimum standards not kept, very many, up to the largely welfare matters and all that. But everything comes down to funding, funding. So, and then lack of political will on those who rule and what they should do that they don't do. So what do we do? We need, we need actually, yes. Ensure adequate and proper training and retraining of our teachers. Training in contents, in processes of science education. We need to revisit and offload inappropriate science curriculum, eliminate gender biases in science education. The women are coming on in engineering classes, in geology now we have a lot of them, but we still have to do more. We have to uh, monitor and evaluate all practices in science education from time to time and have tried to have a shift away from paper certificates and rote learning. 
these are some of the things we need to do. One of the things that bother me um, is the we need the issue of mentoring. But we need to work closely with mentors who have, people who have dis distinguished themselves in science and technology. You see, younger Nigerians now are looking at only, I don't want to start calling names, uh, Whiskey, Davido, and all the people. But if people can fly their own private planes at 25, and they don't even have, well, they can sing, they can do this, or they are Nollywood celebrities. We have to get people begin to look for some of the people Professor Kepu Kola showed you in his slide, uh, the other African people want to aspire. I want to be like uh, Professor Nimi Briggs, who was this and who was that. I want to be like Professor Jakaye, she was this and that and that. But how do we get that? So we are doing some things, but that's actually part of what we need to do. I'd like to show this as my last slide uh, so that we can discuss. I jumped several, but what do we need to do? The first point says tackle the critical issues discussed earlier. Those critical issues first wrong with us. There are about 13 or 15 of them. The system, which all point about rot, no money, carrying capacity, crowded classrooms, inefficient teachers, untrained teachers, exposure. So all of them, many of them are listed there. Then curriculum, curriculum, curriculum. At the bottom, we, we have to reinvent what we are using to teach. I'm not even qualified to talk about curriculum, so I just want to refer you to a manual, which is quite recent, authored by our facilitator general himself. I was there when it was presented. I sat close at the platform when it was presented at NUC. The former President Chief, Dr. Michel Basanjo, who shared that occasion. And it's just a major reference, among others, of how we can actually do that in the universities. Because it's a higher education level particularly that bothers me. Because people come out from school and it's there that the teachers themselves are, uh, we need to work on them. So uh, that's a major reference, how we can go to reinvent that curriculum. A lot of that is several, so you can check that out. I think for now, that's the much the time will allow me to say uh, about that. Then, then um, of course, of course uh, we can go and uh, discuss it. Thank you, thank you very much for listening. Now, I would like to have your questions. I'll, I'll remove my screen if, if uh, let's, let's see how, how do I do. Okay, questions from anyone that may have a question and uh, so that we can continue the discussion for the a uh, little time that we still have. I don't know how much time we have. So, yeah, but we, we, we would like to, first of all, uh, uh, I'm going to unmute everybody for you to uh, okay. Okay. very soundly for... Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the lecture, professor. My question is, what is the Nigerian Academy of Science doing to bring up the grassroots schools where we have of the Nigerian upcoming youth population to ensure that we have a science-rich society? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, the Nigeria Academy of Science is very interested in the younger generation. We have a program which we have been executing for about seven years now. Uh, it is funded largely by Schlumberger, which, which is one of the big oil service companies. It is called SEED, S-E-E-D, Schlumberger Excellence in Educational Development. With just what I was, where, where I closed with, we send our fellows, well-known professors, they go, they adopt secondary schools. And when we say secondary schools, we're not talking about King's College 
or international school in Ibadan. We're talking about backyard schools. And then work with them. We've been doing that for years. And the winners, it's a competition among secondary schools in Nigeria. And the winners get a lot of prizes, laboratory equipment, and they travel to France. Several schools have won that. And, and I myself have been going to Professor, Professor Briggs and other people. Professor Duo Alayanka, I don't know which school he was going to in Ibadan. We adopted not the ones inside the elitist schools, but the backyard schools. Yeah, we're working hard on that. Wonderful. Thank you so very much. Uh, so, uh, this is Nurujin Adijimi. Uh, you can take the floor now. Nurujin Adijimi, you have the floor. If he's not taking the floor, let somebody else uh, please come on. Just unmute your microphone and let's have you speak. Uh, thank uh, thank you, for you for your wonderful lecture, sir. Uh, sir, uh, so one, one of your slides really, really touched, touched me so much. So much. And, my and my question is, uh, what, what, what is the recent, recent development on how data, data can be acquired in a typical swampy areas? areas? Because, because uh, in 2009, I was, I was employed, employed as a trainee for Chinese National, Chinese National, National Petroleum Corporation in Portacos. And, and after visiting that uh, sample area, area for six months, six months I resigned. Many, Many people, people will not have opportunity like me to get other jobs. jobs. So, what so what are, are the recent ways that in which science can help us to collect data in that sample uh, area, considering the hazard that is involved in that uh, process? Thank, Thank you very much. Yes, yes, we can, we can collect, collect data today in almost any kind of environment. We can, we can collect data in almost any kind of environment. Kind of environment. New, New tools are, are coming up for geophysical, geophysical exploration. The, the, the reason why you need to go through the swamps is because the seismic method still remains the most detailed that you give you information from deep down. We can use aerial methods, we can fly. But they all have their limitations in resolution and the depth of penetration you can see inside the ground. And the oil we are looking for, particularly in Nigeria, they are domiciled the layers that have the oil are between three and four kilometers inside the ground. So that's deep. And to be able to see an image that deep, you need some specialized tools. But you see the mangrove and all that jungle is not a problem. I don't know why you went out, but I'm sure you can weather it. They'll give you the, the personal protection equipment and so on. We have that too, not like and gas. And it can be a lot of fun, and you can get a lot of money. But the tools are available. Thank you so very much. Yeah. No routine. I saw your hand up. Are you are you available now? Or else somebody who is uh, available can just unmute and ask this question. Sir, my concern is about the science curricula as we use in our secondary schools. With this. Uh, Talk this morning. I can see that uh, the world of science is so big, so large, but the curricula we are using in the secondary school are so so narrow, narrow to subject matters I mean, that are not related to our daily living. What is the effort, or what are the efforts of the Academy of Science in relating scientific operations? To our daily living, as in, how are they helping to bridge the gap between the curriculum and and uh, what what happens in the class and what happens in the society? Thank you, sir. Well, um, the academy itself can only do what it can as an academy. Um, it's made up of individuals. Some of them, um, most of them, are people who have belong in the profession, whether they're in medicine or engineering or pure applied science. We do our bit. We're talking about secondary school and lower levels. What's the science there? We're talking about biology. We're talking about chemistry. We're talking about physics. We're talking about mathematics. The problem is the curriculum. I'm not the expert on curriculum, but I know in the U.S., even in my area, which is geoscience, the, K the people in secondary school can discuss earthquakes, they discuss oil exploration, they have, they have a way of putting down, bringing things down to their level, which we are not doing yet here. But even if we were doing the type of chemistry, physics, and biology that we did in secondary school many years ago, we went to one of the oldest secondary schools in Nigeria and so on, and people left that school and went to Cambridge. 
Prosanya, Oanya, and the rest of them, all the people went to that school, went left from there and went. So we had good science. There was good science in our secondary school. The problem, just teaching physics, chemistry, mathematics, biology. We need to return to that good science where in those days of the higher school, people are di carrying out dissections, things people don't even do in first year in the universities, the type of experiments people are doing for A levels then. So we need to bring back the, those who will teach, the chemicals, the reagents, and so on. We need to get back to the basics and retool the curriculum as I said. Thank you very much. That's all we can take because Professor, uh, well, I can see David Biamungu is raising his hand. Can you ask a question very quickly? Because Professor Bill Kyle is, almost, is gone just a little bit after 5 a.m. in his uh, location has joined us. So let's thank have thank you, Prof. Yes, okay, David. Thank you. Thank for you for the floor. The floor. Uh, I can understand the professor told about uh, innovation and uh, uh, innovation and de de development, but uh, in our countries, where is the place of uh, political systems in Africa? Because all of that, to be revisit curricula and so on, it needs uh, much money. And uh, in our system, there is no money to change everything and to go very far. Well, the, the political system is very important. Politicians have an important role to play. They bring out policies. They are the policy makers. Even as an academy, the major thing we try to do is to influence policy by bringing by giving evidence-based scientific advice. So politics is important. They need to know what is good for their people. And education is very important. Science education is important. So we need to put money there. That's just simple. And one last thing I would like to say before I yield the microphone, and that's an answer to the, a question that was asked to so Kev Kola at the beginning during his talk about scientists. I like to share the fact that the African Union today has a desk compiling the list of African scientists. It's in existence. What is not uh, done, done is that it's not that is it's not, it's not comprehensive, comprehensive still but there's, but there's a lot, a lot. The, the 54 nation african union have an african uh, union, uh, union uh, science, science and technology division incidentally, incidentally some of the african union's uh, offices some are based in uh, headquarters in addis ababa some in nairobi but this AUHTRC in child of science i think is based in abuja here in nigeria and they are compiling, and there's a new effort also by the Africans to have that list as comprehensive as possible. The South African Scientific Research and Innovation Council created recently in 2018 by the 54 Nation Africans. And uh, that work is now ongoing through academies, through research foundations of various nations, depending on some have national research foundation, some have academies, some still don't have and so on all academy science engineering medicine education by trying to compile that list and it's an ongoing job i thought i should just offer that this is uh, quite uh, enlightening quite refreshing uh, there's no way we can close this session uh if uh, professor michael Faboro, the former uh secretary general of uh association of vice president so professor Faboro, you have the floor sir Okay, Prosperity is not on. Uh, yes, sir. Mute you know, yourself. Mood, okay. Yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry. I, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm on, on now. now. Uh, thank, uh, thank, you for, you for uh, thank, thank you for, for this opportunity, opportunity and, and uh, thanks, Professor Roja, for the brilliant presentation. I uh, was just wondering, in the list of uh, new innovations, you seem to have missed out internet of things deliberately or just that over very important very important i skipped i skipped i skipped i skipped some sections on the ai is there okay thank you so very much in the slides i would like to bring the uh session to a close and uh for all of us to show appreciation just clap and let's see you see your hand like that to clap and appreciate uh, Professor Michael Baborode for a very wonderful presentation. Yes, yeah, so we will take a two-minute break. Uh, we have another two minutes. Professor.
Bill Kyle, who is already here. Bill, can you can you announce your presence and show your face? Good morning to everyone. How are you doing? Yes, uh, Bill is there. Bill is uh, right there, and uh, we uh, will take him in a minute. So just relax. Uh, two minutes. If you have a cup of tea around you, there, so we're back to you in two minutes. <laughs> 